Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast for the foreign policy and global development communities and anyone who wants a deeper understanding of what is driving events in the world today. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch. Enjoy the show. It has been a very intense few weeks of diplomacy at the United Nations. Even before Russia mounted its full-scale invasion of Ukraine, there were several meetings at the Security Council intended to deter and dissuade Russia from doing so. And it was in the middle of one such council meeting on February 23rd that Vladimir Putin declared war and began the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Two days later, Russia predictably vetoed a Security Council resolution denouncing the invasion, and from there, the action went to the entire UN General Assembly and its 193 member states. On March 2nd, the General Assembly overwhelmingly passed a resolution calling on Russia to withdraw its troops from Ukraine and stop the assault. And it was just a couple hours after this vote at the UN General Assembly, in which I caught up with my guest today, Anjali Dayal. She is an assistant professor of international politics at Fordham University and a longtime UN watcher. We kick off discussing the significance of this General Assembly vote before having a broader discussion about how Russia-focused diplomacy is playing out at the United Nations. This is a good conversation between two veteran UN watchers, me, the journalist, and Anjali, the academic expert. And I do think it does a good job of both explaining the diplomatic dynamics underway at the United Nations and also sketching out what may come next at the UN in terms of Russia-focused diplomacy. And this episode is produced in part through the support of the Carnegie Corporation of New York. As always, feel free to get in touch with me at Mark L. Goldberg on Twitter or by using the contact button on globaldispatches.org. All right, now here is my conversation with Anjali Dial. Under the terms of the UN Charter, the UN Security Council has primary responsibility for maintaining international peace and security. Uniting for Peace resolution, which dates to 1950, is basically an effort to solve the problem of what to do when the Security Council is divided and won't act on a question of international peace and security. This is usually always because one of the permanent members um, of the Security Council disagrees with the primary consensus of the, the rest of the Security Council. And so in that sense, it's an effort in some ways to circumvent the great power of great power politics of the Security Council with a demonstration that the collective will of the international community may be a different way. It refers the matter to the UN General Assembly to undertake. The UN General Assembly can't issue binding resolutions like the UN Security Council, but it can, as it did today, demonstrate the, the sort of general consensus among the society of states of the United Nations. Uh, and so let's go back uh, all the way to last Friday. It, it seems like a an eternity ago, but it was Friday, uh, and we're speaking now on Wednesday, March 2nd, uh, that the Security Council held its resolution on Russia, condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine, demanding uh, the immediate withdrawal. Uh, can you explain what happened in that Security Council session? Yeah, last Friday, we had a Security Council session, as you said, where a resolution that the the language ended up being a little gentler than condemning, but that um, took Russia to task for its invasion of Ukraine. And there were, at the end of the day, um, three abstentions, one veto, and everyone else on the Security Council voted in favor of the, the resolution. Um, but because of the structure of the UN Security Council, that single veto from permanent member, Russia, uh, blackballs the the resolution. It's no longer possible for the Security Council to do anything about it within the framework of of that chamber, Um, which is when we start to see the move towards the the Uniting for Peace resolution, which is rarely used. This is the 11th time um, in the UN's history it's been used. It's the first time in 40 years that the Security Council has referred a matter to the General Assembly 
And, and I think it's important just to spend a moment uh, digging into and describing the dynamics at the mm-hmm. Security Council that led to uh, that vote uh, in which I think it was 11 votes in favor uh, three abstentions and the Russian veto. Uh, all of the you know countries you expect it to be in favor were in favor. Uh, the abstentions were China, which is significant for, for reasons I'll have you explain, uh, the United Arab Emirates and India. Now, it was just reported like a minute before we spoke, so, so I, I doubt that you may have seen this, that the United Arab Emirates apparently abstained as opposed to voting with the United States, its close ally in this resolution, as sort of payback to the United States for what it perceives to be insufficient American support for its war in Yemen. Uh, this was reported in Politico, or pardon me, Axios, just, just moments ago, which is a fascinating additional diplomatic wrinkle uh, to this all. Uh, but can you maybe just kind of discuss, explain why would India and China most prominently uh, abstain from this resolution? Absolutely. Um, I had not seen that news about the United Arab Emirates, but that is a fascinating wrinkle to this problem. Um, China has a really uh, has a really complicated relationship with the questions of uh, sovereignty and intervention at the UN Security Council. It is, um, you know, as you said, the usual countries we would expect to va- vote in favor of this resolution voted in favor of it, but. Critically, crucially, you know, the way the problem was framed was as one of global threat, that what has happened when Russia has invaded Ukraine is a threat to countries worldwide, because it calls into question one of the primary principles of the UN Charter, one of the first principles of the UN Charter, um, sovereign non-intervention, equality of states, member states in the Security Council, and territorial integrity. And usually, those are principles that China is very strongly in favor of. Uh, in this venue, the, the discomfort with, um, with, with voting in favor of this resolution, I think, shows us two things. It shows us, first, that you know, at the Security Council, there is frequently um, an alliance between Russia and China in va- voting in favor of this norm of, territor- of territorial integrity and sovereignty as a way of sort of uh, forming a bulwark against the more inve- in- the perceived to be more interventionist plans of the other uh, permanent members of the Security Council. But it also shows us something about uh, the success of U.S. diplomacy, I think, because China didn't vote with Russia in this case. It didn't give Russia political cover. Instead, it stuck out, struck out um, a, a position that essentially said, you know, we, we're not going to give political cover to this act by Russia, but we're also not necessarily going to sign on to this resolution with which we have some real reservations. I, I should say, I agree with your assessment that uh, China's abstention was a victory for U.S. and European foreign policy. They could have uh, given... Um, support to Russia, but they chose not to in, in, in a public way. What about India? Yeah, this is, I think, um, you know, this is this is an important question because unlike the United Arab Emirates, um, which today voted in favor of the, the UN General Assembly resolution, um, India also abstained today from the from the um, from the General Assembly resolution. And here we've got this like interestingly complicated, long-running relationship between India and Russia, um, where R- India has focused almost exclusively its diplomacy around securing the safety of Indian students and Indian nationals in Ukraine at the moment. And it's taken a pretty significant, I think, diplomatic hit from it. But I also think, and I'm not an India foreign policy hand, I'm not someone who's a specialist um, in the foreign policy of India, but, but a lot of Indian foreign policy hands are saying, this is always to be expected. This was always the way India was going to go on this resolution uh, because of long running historic ties with Russia that involve security cooperation, that involve um, economic cooperation, and that involve cultural cooperation. So the abstention is a way, not necessarily, as I understand it, in their view, of giving Russia political cover, but also not incruing Russian disfavor. So 
the vote owing to the Russian veto made its way to the General Assembly uh, for a vote today. Uh, there was a long lead up uh, to today's vote with um, dozens and dozens of member states speaking ahead of the vote uh, since Monday. Monday morning is when the emergency special session started and it continued all the way through this morning on, on Wednesday, March 2nd. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know how closely you, you are following many of the speeches. I, I sort of tuned in and out uh, fairly often. Uh, and one sort of recurring theme that was pretty interesting to me, at least, was how countries that are like far removed from this crisis, small island states like Palau or Papua New Guinea even, um, were describing how the Russian invasion of Ukraine, though happening so far removed from their shores and in their borders, nonetheless sort of directly impacted them as a kind of a weaker country that has experienced sort of colonization before. You had all these sort of invocations of the danger to these small states of living in a world in which might makes right and the rule of law is replaced by the rule of the jungle. And, and there's just some really like fascinating and um, very just like, articulate expressions of the danger that uh, this conflict poses to them, even though, uh, again, they are so far removed. Uh, you know, what stood out from you for, from what you were able to follow uh, during these speeches and, and the vote today? As you said, the existential stakes of this question uh, kept coming up again and again in the course of these speeches. And, you know, I think it was St. Vincent and the Grenadines that ended up being the last speaker um, from the General Assembly floor right before the vote. And, and the representative said, this is, this is an existential question for us. The question of our survival as a state depends on whether or not the rights of equal sovereignty and territorial integrity apply to all states. This is something, for instance, the Marshall Islands highlighted yesterday as well. Um, countries, as you said, that are far afield of a security crisis in the heart of Europe, but for whom this UN charter is the legal underpinning for their existence. And the way the debate has been framed by a lot of small island nations, yes, but also by a lot of uh, post-colonial states and a lot of as a, a lot of states that that um, came into being at the same time as the United Nations and immediately after uh, their their point is about exactly as you said what kind of international order we live in whether we live in this sort of classically realist international order of power politics where strong states exercise their will unrestrained or whether we live in a world where sovereign non-intervention is a cornerstone principle of international law and people can be called out for that where in theory even if the principles of the UN charter can't stop great power aggression. Other states can reassert the invalidity and the illegitimacy of the action. And the way that they sort of um, pressed on this issue was to say that, you know, the permanent five members of the Security Council have at different times been guilty of this. But every time they strike this blow, they strike another blow against multilateralism and the system of states that sustains the very existence and um, independence of small states the worldwide. And the dynamic that you described led to a, I think, very just interesting and really profound uh, votes at the secure at, at the UN General Assembly today. So the uh, four countries to vote with Russia are sort of to be expected. Belarus, Eritrea, North Korea, and Syria. They were, with Russia, the five no votes today. Interestingly, though, you saw countries like Cuba, like Venezuela, abstain from the vote, like Serbia, longtime countries that have had, or countries that have had long relationships with Russia, sort of choosing to abstain as opposed to support Russia because I think of many of the dynamics that you described this this sort of tension between between being anti-colonialist and 
supporting Russia. So to me, those abstentions were, were just like really, really interesting and I think significant. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, one thing that we really see um, come to the fore is this idea that, you know, Ukraine is a founding member of the United Nations. Uh, the sort of independence and sovereignty of Ukraine, and this is something that states coming to the floor addressed again and again, uh, is of obvious critical importance to Ukrainians. The The sort of first issue at hand is, of course, the, the humanitarian disaster that will that will result from this invasion. But critically for these states, the idea that another founding member of the of the United Nations might, without notice, without sanction, without comment, be subject to this kind of of activity from a permanent five member, I think you know that that is, as you say, um, strikes at the heart of the multilateralist project, brings to the fore these anti colonialist projects, and can make these previous coalitions uh, not so significant. Uh, so. As you said earlier, unlike action at the Security Council, a vote at the UN General Assembly is not legally binding. It can't like force Russia to withdraw its its troops from Ukraine right now. So stepping back, what would you say is the significance of of this vote at the General Assembly today? Like what difference do you think it may make or not? I think ultimately the structure of the United Nations, the structure of power we have in the international system, all of those things, by design, the United Nations is never going to be able to stop the aggressive actions of one of its permanent five members. It lacks that capacity. It was deliberately constructed to not interfere with the plans of the permanent five members. Um, But what a vote like something that the UN General Assembly can do is demonstrate in this case, how diplomatically isolated Russia is in this plan. As you noted, you know, the five countries that voted with Russia, not so surprising. Um, and countries that, that have, you know, themselves sought political cover from Russia for past actions that the UN has taken them to task for. So in that sense, that the General Assembly vote can show us that Russia is diplomatically isolated, that the vast majority of countries would prefer to abide by the terms of the UN Charter in the way that they've laid out, with explicit reference in the resolution that they voted on. Um, they want to live in a world where the, the equal sovereignty of member states and the territorial integrity of states is primary, where a multilateral system continues to flourish. Now, that isn't, of course, going to stop Russia from, from continuing its innovation. It is not going to solve this problem. It is not going to ameliorate the intense human human suffering that's going to come from this. But as diplomatic bodies go, sending that signal is about the most it can do. And it sent that signal fairly strongly today. So I also think that there's some political importance to uh, this demonstration of diplomatic isolation. You know, the kind of strategy that has been explicitly you know, stated from the Biden administration, from its European partners, from, from NATO, and, and I say the West more generally, has been one that seeks to isolate economically and uh, politically Russia from the rest of, of the world. And to me, at least, what this vote demonstrates is that there is, first of all, it's like a manifestation of that, of that strategy. It is, you know, what the point of that strategy is to accomplish. Uh, it also seems to um, be a reflection that the rest of the world kind of supports that U.S.-led strategy on Russia. Uh, do you sort of accept that sort of premise? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think, you know, there is um, a real sort of underlying conversation about the intensive diplomatic work that um, the Biden administration and their European allies have been doing over the last couple of days and weeks. I think, and you know, I don't I don't know because I'm not privy to these conversations, obviously, but the the sort of speed at which diplomatic and security decisions have been taken across Europe that are quite different than ones that were in place even a week and a half ago. Um, And the speed with which a huge coalition of states signed up to co-sponsor 
these two first the the um the UN Security Council resolution and then the UN General Assembly resolution tells us something about the intensity of this diplomatic effort and how vital it is, perhaps for wildly different motivations, I think, um, but for a majority of states to want to, to be seen to be aligning themselves with this effort. Uh, so I misspoke earlier. I said that Serbia abstained from the resolution. In fact, it voted for uh, the resolution. And uh, the Serbian representative to the United Nations ahead of the vote itself it, you know, gave his explanation of vote, you know, restated his country's grievances with NATO, but nonetheless said that this was like, a, you know, uh, that what Russia did crossed a red line. Uh, and so voted in favor of this resolution, which is, I think, even more surprising. Um what comes next, do you suppose, at the United Nations in terms of kind of collective diplomatic action intended to either punish Russia or deter it from, you know, taking even more, you know, drastic steps in, in Ukraine? I think, honestly speaking, this is where the secretariat comes to the fore. The, as they did with Syria, um, the, the Security Council has separated out the political portfolio from the humanitarian portfolio in Ukraine. And so the efforts um, around humanitarian relief and refugee assistance and um, questions of displacement will proceed separately from political questions. And the hope is perhaps to make some political headway around those humanitarian questions, even when the political and military questions remain at an impasse. This is also, I think, where we will see, um, with the appointment of a special representative, um, with the sort of work of UN agencies, at this point, the key effort becomes to offset the, the, offset the, the sort of, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, to offset the crisis, the humanitarian crisis that this invasion will provoke. So at this point, you know, the primary responsibility of the Secretariat will be to help people who are fleeing from this violence and to help bring aid to people who are caught in it. Um, in terms of member state efforts, y the Security Council, it's going to prove to be very difficult to get any action on the Security Council vis-a-vis -vis this question. Uh, primarily because there is no way around that Russian veto. There is, um, you know, the, the Uniting for Peace resolution is possible because you, a permanent member can't veto a procedural question, which is how the, the Uniting for Peace resolution ends up with the UN General Assembly. But that Russian veto is always going to be there on other political questions and on other questions of um, condemning Russian action. So there... Mm -hmm. Well, I was like, what about um, other venues of the United Nations, like the UN Human Rights Council? I mean, you saw this dramatic walkout in Geneva of yeah. diplomats when Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, spoke. But Russia, you know, happens yeah. to be a member of the Human Rights Council right now. We've seen instances in the past, and I'm thinking of Gaddafi's Libya in 2011, in which member states voted to boot uh, a, um, uh, a member from the Human Rights Council. I mean, could we see those kind of lower tier UN venues being used as further opportunities to isolate or punish Russia? I think that's definitely a possibility. As we saw today, there are not that many, Russia does not have that many friends at the UN at the moment. And so being booted from the UN Human, UN Human Rights Council, you know, that's actually a fairly costless thing for other states to vote to do. So it, in that sense, you know, is definitely a possibility. I think also when we think about what the next steps for the UN are, one of the key things the UN can do at this point is start trying to collect and produce information about things like human rights violations, about things like casualties. Um, and these other organizations will be key venues for that. Um, I, lastly, uh, I, I wanted to get your take on this idea suggested not so subtly by Ukraine's ambassador to the United Nations that Russia's seat at the UN is in fact illegitimate for some reason dating back to the early 1990s and the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Can you maybe just like briefly explain 
the premise of that argument, which to me seems far fetched and, and not likely to happen. But I, I'd love to hear you kind of flesh it out because it has been getting uh, some uh, attention. Yeah, um, I saw a New Yorker writer tweeted out earlier today, for instance. I mean, I think, you know, it is getting legs in popular debate in a way that sort of belies how how unlikely and obscure the idea actually is. And to put it in like plain language terms, um, essentially Ukraine is arguing that because Russian membership was never formally voted on, the the Russia has no legitimate legal right to occupy the permanent seat at the UN Security Council. Now, this is an idea that's been floating around for a while in Ukrainian um, Ukrainian international law circles, but there is, as you said, this is not really a real proposition. Um, in part because if we leave everything else aside, the there is no interest in the larger international community in interrogating and questioning whether or not Russia should uphold the legal obligations that the Soviet Union undertook. This is particularly the case when we think about nuclear issues. There is no world in which other states want to meaningfully open up the question of whether or not Russia is obligated to to um, to uphold its obligations under the many, many uh, weapons of mass destruction treaties the Soviet Union was a party to. So practically, this is not really something other member states want to open up. Legally, it seems to be a dubious argument as well. As an end run around the problem of the Russian veto, we can see why it would have real appeal to people who are desperate for some recourse that isn't going to be immediately stymied by Russia with its permanent membership and its veto power. Uh, well, Anjali, thank you so much for your time. Maybe before I let you go, you know, what else will be looking towards at the United Nations? I mean, personally, I'm going to be, as you mentioned earlier, keenly focused on how UN agencies like the UN Refuge, Refugee Agency, UNICEF, the World Food Program, OCHA, which is the uh, UN Humanitarian Coordination Center, is responding to this crisis and whether or not uh, these agencies will receive the funding they need to mount a robust response to this this crisis. Uh, what else will you be looking towards at the United Nations? Uh, I think one thing that's really um, really been dramatic, I think, for a lot of people across a lot of different venues, is the absolutely stunning diplomatic job Ukraine has done in the first week of of this invasion. There political messaging, their ability to reach audiences, um, and their ability to sort of build coalitions around this issue has been astonishing to watch, I think. And that's something we'll be looking for, to watch how they proceed along these, along diplomatic lines at the UN and to see what other avenues open up as a result. I'm also interested in, in watching how these smaller states try and reaffirm multilateral structures in the face of what is likely to be a long and horrifying uh, conflict. And in that sense, you know, for them, this question of multilateralism and of sovereign non-intervention, this is life or death. And so I do expect this. I do expect to see this theme come up again. And I'll be looking for, for sort of how it takes hold and what kinds of diplomatic projects open because of it. Uh, well, Anjali, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, as always, to Anjali Dayal. She is out with a new book about the United Nations and peacekeeping, uh, which I will link to in the show notes of this episode. And just one disclaimer that the opinions and views expressed in this episode belong solely to those of us who expressed these opinions and views. All right. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.